Thank you. So uh, just, I guess we're all very well versed in, in uh, uh, online meetings now, but uh, clearly, if you wouldn't mind um, muting, I think everybody has done it. Uh, I will also uh, stop sh sharing my video after this. Now you know the, how I look like, and um, it, it just needs a bit more bandwidth and for people who struggle, and that can sometimes be me. Uh, I think it's just better that we do it that way. So I'll, I'll do that maybe just now, otherwise I will forget. Uh, obviously, feel free to uh, interrupt at any time. I think you can either raise your hand or, or you can also just try and ask a question. Don't notice uh, that you have raised your hand, then you just uh, unmute and keep on going. The um, aim for uh, now is to have a series of talks on uh, pet, uh, what we try and do uh, on, on the stir side, but just gives you some, some background information first. And then um, for the rest of the week, uh, some of us will want to hang on and participate in a virtual hackathon. I'll, uh, just very briefly, the idea there is that we identify a few topics that uh, interest the people who have the time to participate. And we sort of subdivide ourselves in, in groups, depending on people, what, what they want to do. And try and make as much progress as we can and then every day in the morning at uh, nine in uk time we we will have a catch up on uh, see what everybody's doing so we're not going to all be working on the same topic but on different ones so um i'll talk a little bit more about that later after this meeting but i just wanted to mention that if people feel like joining uh, that and they haven't registered in the form or so that's fine uh, just hang on after this software meeting so um, this is the 27th software framework meeting of the uh, formerly ccp petamar and now ccp synergy project but it's a rather different one because it, it really does target the pet crowd very much and uh, the stir crowd in particular so um, there's going to be nothing on surf or synergistic reconstruction or anything like that here um, just to to clarify that um, obviously whatever we do uh, on stir side will help uh, surf and, and the synergistic reconstruction aspect okay so um let me try and share my screen While you're doing that, Chris, I, I had a question. Um, uh, well, I guess we'll probably find it through through the meeting, but um, uh, are we kind of expecting that um, people uh, already know what they're wanting to work on um, and uh, will jump into groups or um, how, well, I, yeah, I guess, I guess we'll find it towards the end. I was just wondering how the um, uh, divvying up of, of tasks between people and that sort of stuff. Yeah, will work. I, I think we will find out after after this meeting because I, I, I mean, at at the moment, well, last time uh, Eduardo checked, there were eight people who registered, but I actually know there are a few more. Um, so we we will sort of see. Um, and I, hopefully it will also a little bit uh, be uh, clearer to people what type of things we want to do. So the, the talks in, this, in the next uh, period are intended to sort of tell people, okay, this is what exists and what uh, type of things we are missing and we, we might want to address and then we'll find out later. Okay, so the, the program uh, is uh, I, I thought it would be useful to just give 
an overview of what recently happened in STIR because it, uh, it well, there's quite a lot and also it is maybe a little bit confusing uh, on how it all fits together. Um, so uh, we'll continue with Ash uh, talking about uh, bed positions and coordinate systems and all of those things. And I, uh, pre to prepare for the rest of the talks, I thought it would be useful to give a, a review on, on basic pet concepts. So I'm, I'm not going to give an explanation on all of that now, but just the main items that are there. Uh, Robbie will talk about our recent uh, release from last week on how to integrate stir and gate better. Uh, Palak will give a talk on her uh, work on supporting the GE Sigma and then recent work with Ander on uh, supporting other GE PET CT scanners that use the same file format. And uh, George will um, talk about his project that is then using Gate and Stir and uh, on, on the MCT, and that sort of leads into things that we, we might want to do. And there is no more actually that we forgot to remove from the, from the table. Okay, so uh, I think I just start with my overview of recent uh, stir developments. Sorry, it's taking a bit because Zoom slows down my computer quite a lot. No, can't. Yeah. Okay. So uh, last, uh, well, and end of April, I guess we released version four after a, an enormous gap uh, for version three. So lots of things happened between three and four, but um, somehow we never got around to actually giving it a new release. And so it was high time to do that. Uh, this, uh, I, I hope you've sort of seen the announcements and, and so on. So I probably not incredibly useful to go through this list here and I'm certainly not going to give more information. You, uh, the slides and the talks will, will be shared uh, later on the website and um, you can find links in there for, for more information. But just a few things uh, maybe uh, from all of this is that OpenMP support is, uh, for multi-threading is now more widespread. And uh, obviously, if you have multi-core processors, it allows you to speed things up. Um, there's a lot of work on scatter estimation uh, to make that a lot easier, because before it was via scripts that nobody really understood. Um, so now it's much easier to use and has been tested for a few scanners. Um, it's an implementation from Daniel Data's hybrid uh, kernel exp expectation maximization algorithm that also now is uh, more generic than what is described in his papers. It allows you to have multiple bits of site information or uh, none at all, uh, which is um, under investigation at the moment. Um, a lot of work on specs as well by, by Daniel Deida, and um, but we're not going to go into spec today. Um, and then some other things in, in particular, if you look at below there, there's um, much better support for root and uh, output of gate and for the Siemens MMR. It's not, not quite finished, but uh, a lot of it is there. And so those are things that we want to, uh, that are related to what we want to do this week. So uh, we have 
developments on top of version four at the moment. Um, the first one you're going to hear about uh, later today. Uh, Richard has implemented a, a wrapper for the Nifty Pets GPU forward and back projectors that currently tied to the MMR. Um, we're not 100% sure if this is working correct at the moment. Um, we think there's maybe some problems in the Nifty Pets code that we're using, but that's still still under investigation. But the wrapper is there, obviously speed things up. Uh, an implementation of the relative difference prior and, and also um, uh, different energy windows for the uh, spec uh, triple energy windows scatter estimation. So you, you can find the progress in that document. Uh, obviously, 4.1 is not released yet. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so we have one pull request. Uh, people might not be familiar with that terminology, but all our development sits on GitHub. And uh, the way that you contribute code is by uh, essentially making your own copy of stir available on github and then say to us from there please uh, here is a bit of code that you want to be able to pull into your version of stir so uh, this is a way to have safe access uh, and extension in open source software so uh, so the the work that palak did on the signal um had some hardwired numbers and so on in there for for dimensions of the signal and so uh ander has been working on that together with palak to uh, extend it to other scanners uh, for ge so again uh, more on that later and this is the only pull request really that i uh, intend to still consider for 4.1 so with any luck, we can finish that one this week and release the 4.1. Uh, then we have uh, our master branch is uh, is sort of uh, ahead of all of this. And uh, there is no major features on there. You can see a list here of what we currently have. Uh, all the things from the release four branch are merged onto master as well. Um, you know, have to occasionally redo another another merge. And uh, but we have a few pull requests that we hope to incorporate in our next release five. Um, one is a uh, I think an important one by uh, Parisa and uh, people from ETH in Zurich where she is, was working on a block detectors. Uh, so take the actual position of the detectors into account. Um, so that's a, a pull request that is now there. And uh, feel free to, to play around with it and to, to give some feedback on it as well. Um, we have some work in progress on providing uh, the alternative motion compensated image reconstruction implementation that uh, was available in the experimental branch that only uses a joint resampling. It doesn't need an inverse field. And is the theoretically uh, correct implementation of MCIR in PET. Um, so that should make it on, onto the uh, non-experimental, the, the stable uh, code. Uh, we have some pull requests related to bad positions, which you're going to hear on more, and uh, another one to take uh, rotations between gantry and, and detector coordinate conventions into account, um, which we actually need for GE data. But because it breaks backwards compatibility, we'll only merge that in version 5. So that's quite a lot of stuff there as well. Um, then clearly, there is a time of flight pull request uh, that has been uh, stalled for a while, unfortunately, um, because uh, yeah, just, yeah, just uh, availability of, of time and what people can do. 
Um, so uh, I, that will break backwards compatibility also. And I'm not sure if we will be able to get that into version five because I want to get version five out really rather soon. Um, clearly, if anybody can, can help with that, that will also be very, very useful. Um, and then we have uh, not yet uh, on, on GitHub, but hopefully there soon. And if people are interested, we could do that this week, I think. Um, there is some uh, preliminary code to estimate normalization factors. And uh, Tahera has worked on that to extend it to 3D and to take uh, it into account when you have gaps between detectors. And so that code is available as well. Um, that might make it into version five, depending. And also, well, okay. So things that we hope to, to work on in this hackathon or the near future is uh, additional support for virtual crystals, um, which you'll hear a bit more about later, which would allow us to, to work better with the Siemens MCT and other Siemens scanners. Uh, and depending on information that we get from GE, uh, we hopefully also extend it to the next version of their file form. And that would allow them is to, to support data from all recent GE scanners. So uh, just finally, there's obviously stories on GitHub and um, we have our, our exercises in Python as well. Um, they probably need a little bit of work because they get updated whenever we do a, a STIR course. And that's now uh, a little bit ago because a lot of it has used SURF in the past. We do have a virtual machine available at the moment. Uh, the only virtual machine comes with uh, everything SURF and, and, and whatever, which there are people might not need. Um, I've looked at uh, putting that in a separate uh, virtual machine, but that um, because of lack of time just hasn't happened. So you, you sort of have to live with downloading a, a rather big one and then updating it as, as I sent instructions recently. Uh, however, we do have now a Conda install, so you can install there with one, one line, which is obviously uh, good if you use Conda anyway. Um, and then we also have some code uh, that allows her to run in the cloud. And uh, that is since merged with surf efforts and again needs a little bit of, of uh, gentle care. But uh, all, all of these are different uh, deployment options for stir. OK. Uh, obviously, it's our main publication and uh, needs to be revised because a lot of things has happened since version two. And I'd just like to thank uh, both GE Healthcare and Siemens Health Engineers who have agreed to make, uh, to allow us to uh, make open source versions of code that reads their file formats. I, I now have uh, signed letters from both these companies that, that we can do this and so Gradually, you, uh, as you've noticed, more and more information uh, will be added to STIR, and therefore will be able to use uh, will be able to use it for scanners of uh, these two manufacturers. I hope that will be extended to other manufacturers as well. Uh, feel free to help in lobbying. Uh, okay, so that's what I wanted to give you on the STIR side. Uh, yeah, are there any Questions from people at this point. We can come back to it at the end, obviously. Okay, if not, then uh, I think we will switch to um, to Ash to give his talk about. Um, Thank the, you. Uh, yeah. I'll just try and share my screen there. Uh, share. Um, has that worked? 
Yeah, it's working okay. All right. I don't want to make this full screen because then I don't know where it'll go. So I'll just, there's that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can fine. see. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so sorry, I've, I've just thrown this um, together in the last couple hours, so um, I might be reading off my slides a little bit more than I'd, I'd like to, so hopefully it's not too boring. Um, uh, I'd hoped, uh, it turned out today was actually a um, public holiday here, um, which I'd forgotten, and um, I got assigned some, some extra yard work today, so I'd hope to um, actually today get a kickback um, on this project um, to sort of be a bit more current. Um, so I think uh, if we're gonna have another meeting at 9, p at 9 uh, a.m. tomorrow, um, I think we should have a lot more interesting information on here. Because uh, basically this has been um, quite a long ongoing um, endeavor, uh, probably since uh, early 2018, when I first um, came over to the UK, we started some of this stuff. Um, and then kicked off a lot more um, about six months ago, um, getting a few more uh, things in. Um, and I've, I, I guess, kind of um, not been using STIR over the last six months, so I haven't actually uh, been motivated to actually just close this off. Um, so I thought this was a, a excellent opportunity to actually get in and, and um, uh, actually try and close this off, which will be very exciting, I'm sure. Um, but so the, the main, um, uh, oh, I should say also, um, Chris already said, but I'm happy for anyone to interject with questions or comments at, at any time. So just come off mute and, and interrupt me. Um, but so the, the main uh, motivation here is, um, uh, I've, I've pulled this from somewhere else, it should say stirs uh, or surfs. Uh, the output images currently um, aren't directly aligned with the vendor reconstructions. Um, and so what we're looking at trying to do is uh, trying to be able to support that same um, coordinate system uh, that the, the vendors uh, use just to allow for comparison um, using your MR prize if you're um, in SURF or um, having your um, scanner CT scan automatically be aligned for attenuation correction um, and that sort of thing. Um, so just for a little bit of background, STIR, um, uses uh, for, I guess, historical reasons, um, a little bit of a, a different um, coordinate system. Um, uh, it, it makes a lot more sense from a reconstruction perspective. So it's uh, a gantry based coordinate system. Uh, so essentially what you have is the zero point, uh, which I'll call in these slides your frame of reference. So that's where sort of the point where the rest of your image is um, defined from. Uh, that point it sits at the back end in of the um, scanner, uh, right at the end, so in line with the, the first ring. So that would be your first ring at this point through to your nth ring at the front. Um, and it sits in the middle there, and then your um, axes uh, point out this way um, always. So that makes it, um, because your uh, the coordinate system the, uh, of the images in there, um, and I should say this is for the discretized density, um, that makes it um, really nice to be able to map between um, your, uh, your, your sinogram space because this uh, is always constant and it doesn't matter um, uh, how the patient's orientated, uh, oriented and that, and that sort of thing um, in the image. So that's what, what STIR uses, which makes sense from a reconstruction perspective. Um, however, the rest of the, the medical world, so all your DICOMs and nifty formats um, and et cetera, they tend to use patient-based orientation systems, uh, which makes a lot more sense from the sort of end medical uh, clinician user perspective. So they want their images defined with respect to um, the patient's anatomy. Uh, and so what that means is if the patient is in the scanner and they're lying um, prone or supine or however they may be on their back or on their front, um, or whether they're head in or feet, feet in, uh, you're going to get a different mapping then between um, each of the sort of voxels in your, um, your patient-based orientation system uh, versus um, how they actually physically correspond to with respect to your detector elements, um, which corresponds, of course, to your mapping back to your sinogram space. Um, so this was the, the main sort of issue that we had. And um, 
there's there was um, uh, before all this work started sort of um, just a mapping layer on top which sort of was able to um, uh, output to ITK format, um, any of the ITK supported formats, I should say, um, and it would sort of um, lump around this, but uh, this is sort of trying to um, uh, get down in the hood of STIR a little bit more and try and have a more um, native way to be able to uh, represent this. Um, and I should add that also uh, in uh, will uh, allow once once that end-to-end -end, um, process is complete, allow um, importantly bed positions um, to be accounted for because um, of course in a patient orientation system, if the bed moves, the image shouldn't change. Um, like if you've got an image of the head um, and the bed moves up and down, that patient-based orientation system should move with the bed. Um, whereas as that moves, of course your gantry um, position, like your detective positions are changing. Um, with respect to that. So this was um, <laughs> obviously a very formal diagram that I, I pulled out of um, uh, my notes from about six months ago from a, a chat um, that uh, Chris and I had. And this is sort of mapping um, uh, the, the sort of different um, coordinate systems that are um, in STIR um, at the moment. Um, and so some of these don't necessarily formally exist. Um, oh, well actually no, they all, they all do. Um, so you have uh, firstly your sinogram, um, which is your sort of mathematical sinogram. So um, you've got things like your, uh, oh, I forget what all of these are, um, but your, your radius to the line of response, the angle of the line of response um, uh, in the axial direction as well as the offset direction, uh, etc. And then um, also in there, uh, that maps to um, uh, bin locations uh, within the, the sinogram. Um, that gets mapped somehow to this gantry based um, uh, or, uh, coordinate system, I should say. Um, so this gantry coordinate system uh, is um, essentially what is, uh, exists predominantly in STIR uh, at the moment. Uh, and this one, it's a, a millimeter base space. So it's a, a physical space. Um, as I said before, the frame of reference in this gantry space is the center of the first ring. So that's the, the backmost ring. Um, and then, th so that means uh, that the entire coordinate system will remain constant with respect to that ring. Um, so constant uh, with the gantry um, is why, we, uh, why I, I labeled it the gantry coordinate system. Um, and so currently what we're doing then is then mapping to a bed uh, position. Um, so this mapping here essentially only takes into account um, the position of the bed. So it just shifts that coordinate system by uh, the, the bed change. And then we get a coordinate system um, that is um, uh, similar to the gantry coordinates, but now that that frame of reference moves as the bed moves in and out. Um, you've then got these other um, two little coordinate systems, which are in um, your um, in the images, which is a, a relative um, uh, coordinate system. Um, this one, uh, I think, would be a good candidate to remove. It's just a, a convenience one um, where the zero point for that is um, uh, the zero voxel, um, and then it's measures in millimeters and it just maps really easy easily through multiplication to your index value so that's your first voxel and then your 001 voxel or your 010 voxel um, so these um, uh, this one here could probably um, be omitted by mapping directly from your image to your um, index coordinate uh, and then finally you've got your um, LPS coordinate system so the mapping um, from your bed to your LPS just depends on the orientation of the patient. So you need to know uh, exactly which way they're laying, if they're um, on their back or on front and whether their head's going that way or, or that way down the, the, the axis of the, of the scanner. All right, so the progress um, uh, that's sort of already um, mainlined into STIR is that we have got um, this LPS coordinate system um, in STIR, so discretized 
density uh, has um, a function now called get LPS coordinates for indices, um, which will do that, that flipping around for the patient based um, uh, stuff. Um, and then I think uh, Richard actually ended up implementing this, but there's the ability to actually represent the bed position um, in there. Um, and so essentially the, um, uh, what we, what we need to do is actually use these in there um, uh, as it goes in. Now, the sort of confusion um, comes in is where exactly everything needs to know about everything else. So the um, proposed solution at the moment, which is sort of the, the next step is, um, at the moment, this mapping from the sinogram space to the gantry space um, is done by the projectors uh, and it's done uh, individually by each separate projector. So the issue is that there is um, a whole bunch of code all over um, STIR. Actually, I think it's only really in a few places, um, predominantly the, the, the two main projectors um, and the um, the scatter, I think, also used it. Um, Chris, could you just remind me, the, the two projectors, um, we have the matrix projector, which essentially maps, one, one maps kind of forward and one maps kind of back. So I think the matrix projector essentially maps from gantry to the sinogram, and then it sort of works backwards that way because it, it sort of starts out in that gantry space, whereas, or have I got that the opposite? Um, whereas the ray tracing starts in that sinogram space because it knows the, the points of the two um, uh, of the two um, detectors and, and ray traces a line between the two. Um, so you sort of need, um, for each of those projectors, you need a way to map forward given a image voxel to find out what line of responses that could correspond to um, or uh, and an angle, of course, um, or backwards saying for a given sinogram element, what might the gantry positions of the start and end of that line of response, so the two detectors be? Does that sound uh, so that, roughly? That's, that's correct, except that, um, so the, uh, I think the first one you were referring to is the interpolating projector. So you you say for a, for a voxel project, where it is on the projection plane and then do interpolation in projection space. And we have two versions of that. Uh, one very old uh, and somewhat buggy, sadly, um, inline version and another one which tries to do it via a projection matrix by storing it. Uh, I don't think anybody is using that at the moment. So the, the main approaches at the moment are via the ray tracing. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, so the the main, um, I guess, complications with, with this little thing has just been trying to decide architecturally how this should be implemented and I guess it really comes down to who is responsible, or when I say who, which which class, um, uh, which C C plus plus class is is responsible then if we want to have this mapping from you know your sinogram to image space, um, that really should all be in one place, um, and then that way that means if if um, uh, so th that's sort of the first step is to get all of that in one place, and then any changes to any of um, uh, our definitions, if we wanted to change, remove, add any of these um, uh, of these coordinate systems, um, are all located in the one place, and we can um, be consistent about all of that. So that's sort of the um, the goal, I guess. Um, now the the issue is exactly yeah who does that. Um, so our di through the last discussions, I think we end up falling that really the proj data info should be responsible for knowing this mapping. So the proj data info is essentially your sinogram class, um, so your projection data um, or, or the information about the projection data. Um, and so each should be able to know how to map that forward and backwards. Um, now, the sort of complication here is then that project data info needs to know about 
the image space to be able to, to do that as well. So that's where it's kind of got um, quite messy and, and confusing about, um, uh, you know, once you start digging down into these classes and, and trying to refactor all this together um, and then uh, the rest of um, uh, stir sort of falling apart around that. Um, where just so that was um, sort of the, the main um, uh, part of the next step at the moment is to actually perform that refactoring um, and be able to get all that down to one space. Once that's done, um, the remaining elements are actually um, quite simple. Um, uh, they're just sort of uh, basic transformations. Um, initially, uh, I think the, the goal would be just to support um, the bed uh, the, the bed positions that are currently encoded. So that's horizontal pos position and vertical position. Um, but in the future, it could be quite good to be able to have an arbitrary transform between the gantry and the bed, um, which uh, could allow for um, you know, more interesting things, even potentially if you wanted to um, call this patient, you could start looking at motion correction in there, um, and then you can be um, uh, mapping uh, perhaps um, calibration issues, um, say you're working with PET MR and the PET and the MR gantries aren't um, perfectly aligned, you could look at um, calibrating those sorts of things. So I guess that's that's sort of, uh, that's all the slides that I've um, been able to, uh, that I've quickly put together. Uh, so I guess that's a, a rough overview. Um, yeah, great. Thanks, Ash. So, so Unfortunately, this thing does need digging into the murky depths of stir, so which, which makes it hard, and probably very few people want to know this uh, <laughs> the murky depths. Any yeah, it's. For us? Okay, well, I'm sure that there will be more once we we get down to a uh, a smaller crowd of people who want to. Do some developments. Thanks. Yeah, so, I, th I think as I um, update tomorrow, um, hopefully people will have um, uh, a bit more commentary on um, implementations or where this should go, um, where, and that sort of thing. So um, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to do a lot more technical update tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, good. Um, so um, if you don't mind stopping sharing then. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Stop the video. Great. So, um, next talk will be, uh, less stir oriented, um, which might make some of you happy. Um, it's going to, uh, concentrate on, uh, how you model acquisitions in STIR and sort of the, uh, or in PET in general, and uh, what kind of components you need for, you need for that. And often we, we just say, okay, the scanner does it for us, but obviously if we want to write our own uh, complete uh, reconstruction software independent from the scanner, then we need to understand all of this a bit more. It's also of interest, I believe, for for people who just want to know how it all works a little bit more, and not not just for reconstruction. So, uh, the, this is just a, a picture of uh, a quite old uh, GE scanner at the time being installed uh, when I was still at Hammersmith uh, with the Discovery RX, where you see the PET scanner on the right and the CT scanner on the left. is maybe a little bit harder to see with the with the sun, but it's it's over here. So you see there's a lot of electronics here and um, and and detector material and whatever and so somehow we need to get a handle of what is this very complicated machine doing and we need to do that by first understanding what it does and then also doing some measurements along the way. So um, I've I thought the very basic which I'm, I'm sure everybody knows is you have different types of uh, coincidences in in PET. So uh, there are sort of the true ones, which are the ones that you, you'd really like. Then there are scattered ones where one of your photons might be going 
in a different direction because it, it gets scattered away, uh, which could give you two possible situations. One is one of these photons gets detected, the other doesn't, or both photons get detected. And then finally, there's something uh, called accidental coincidences or random coincidence, usually because it's easier to pronounce, um, that are actually two photons that you detect or sometimes even multiple photons that you detect that come from different annihilations. And, and clearly the scatter and the uh, randoms are sort of undesirable. They, they form a uh, background to your true data that is really the bit that we sort of uh, care about in a way. So we, we will need to model all of this. So uh, I'm sure you are aware that PET works by detecting coincidences in time. And so every detector will just be detecting gamma photons. And uh, then there is some circuitry there that says, okay, I have a coincidence if it's the timing of the two events within a certain window, often around four nanoseconds. Um, and so from the detector perspective, you really can't know if this is a true or a coincidence. You can know if it's a single, but those you throw away normally. Um, and so our job of scatter and randoms correction or whatever is to estimate uh, the bad guys, if you like. Okay, so uh, there are then a lot of processes that you need to in take into account when, if you want to model your acquisition process. Uh, and uh, we're not going to talk about most of these today. I'm not going to do posts on range and collinearity and whatever. Um, also not about detector blurring and depth of interaction. Uh, very little about scatter at, at generation. But uh, the detector blurring and accidental coincidences are things that you generally don't hear about too much. And so I'll give a bit more information on that also, because if you want to be able to handle data from a particular scanner, you need to understand those things as well. So in practice, what we normally do is sort of have a, a factorized matrix type of approach where you say, okay, I'll first model positron range, then I'll model photon microarray, then I have scattered attenuation, and then I do detector blurring, and you sort of do it all in stages. That is not 100% accurate in, in many cases, and it will involve interpolations and some approximations, but it's the practical approach that I think yeah, everybody's using. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to try and cover quickly is some information on accidental coincidences. Anyway, you have it on the slide there. Good. So first one. So this is our picture of the accidentals. And uh, often th this is measured if you read the PET uh, literature they will say, uh, we're going to measure this or estimate this using delayed time windows. Um, don't think I have the time to explain this to you now, but essentially what you do is you have a delay line somewhere in your electronics and you then do a coincidence detection where there's actually, let's say a one millisecond delay between the first and the second event. Uh, those are guaranteed to be accidental in some sense. Yes, they are guaranteed to come from different energy uh, annihilations, I'm sorry. And uh, it then turns out, if you think about it very hard, that means they will have the same average rate as the uh, accidental coincidence in your normal coincidence window. That needs a bit of thought, but uh, we're not going to do that now. So uh, many scanners measure your delays. Uh, unfortunately, those delays are uh, a very noisy estimate of the rate of your delayed coincidences. So uh, initially, in the good old days, we were using those directly. 
but now we can't anymore for various reasons and one of the important ones is that if you use that very noisy estimate in your iterative reconstruction uh, in, in a traditional way, things will go very wrong. And so you have to handle that specifically. So what in practice nowadays people do is they take that delayed information and then do some kind of variance reduction on it. And I'll quickly come back to that in a minute. Um, Okay, so that's one way of doing things. The other one is uh, often called randoms from singles. So uh, again, this needs a bit of thought and now is not the time to, to explain this properly to you, but uh, some scanners can measure the singles rates at every, so every detector, every crystal measures the singles rates coming in and then you can understand that in, in very good approximation, the uh, average rate of the randoms will be proportional to the singles rate at, at every detector. You can sort of feel that if you're, if one detect, suppose you only have random coincidences, so never the true ones, then the amount of randoms that you're going to get is uh, going to be proportion to the uh, single straight that you get at one of the detectors and therefore at both. And then there's a proportionality factor that again, you need to think about. But, um, so if you measure your singles, the advantage of that is that it's a very simple calculation to get your randoms. And moreover, your singles are uh, very high count and therefore, because it's Poisson statistics, not noisy at all. So this estimate uh, is, is different from the delays in the sense that it doesn't give you, it hardly has any noise in your randoms estimate. However, there might be some, some bias there because of that time issues, uh, which you maybe want to handle that. So Chris, can I ask a quick question? Sure. If you have a scanner that's capable of doing this, would this always be the preferred method? I. I think so because the uh, in practice, but the people who do measure the delays, they will normally use this formula to denoise their data anyway. So there are people who make corrections on on the formula on the screen, where they say uh, at high count rates this formula is not not really true anymore because you have multiple coincidences and things and start to be a bit more complicated. But uh, the amount, if, if you just use the delays, there might be little bias in them, but the amount of noise is incredible. So this approach might give you a tiny bit of bias, but it, you have no noise left. So in practice, it, I would think it's a preferred way of doing things, but that's obviously a decision for the manufacturer. Sure, okay. Yeah, uh, so, okay, so what do people do that do measure the delays then? Well, they, they say, uh, or can say anyway, that uh, my delays are a noisy version of my uh, randoms, but the randoms are also a noisy version of an underlying process. So if I model that process using the formula that you have above here, then you can try and uh, do some denoising. And so the idea there is to say, uh, I have uh, the notation here is a, a little bit maybe uh, confusing at this point, but if I have some data, which I can model as a product of two singles or at, at things that happen at every detector, plus some stuff that takes whatever coincidence window and, and things into account, then I can uh, try and estimate my mean from noisy data using maximum likelihood or, or similar approaches. And so, you can stick that into your normal Poisson lock likelihood and do some optimization, which is not going to be MLEM, but you, okay, you can, you can optimize this and there is about five different uh, 
uh, papers on this in, in the literature. And so you then get your, in the notation on the slide, it gives you the epsilons, but in practice, it could give us the singles. So from delays, we can estimate singles per crystal, and from singles per crystal, we can go back then to the noised version of the rounds. So I believe that is what Siemens uses uh, while GE measures the singles in every crystal. Um, so these are some examples of singles that you can get out of this out of this method. I'm not going to get too much into that. The only thing maybe worth mentioning is that to be able to do this, you want to first compute some phantoms. And uh, so in in stir in you this is two two step process. First compute randoms, sorry, phantoms from the delays and then do the maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, so just a little bit on what then happens in, in the body itself. And really, this is all about photons interacting in the body. And in practice, it's really only Compton scatter. So um, the both Compton and photoelectric effect are physical effects that change the energy of the detected photon and they actually lower it. So what in practice nearly all PET scanners use is something called energy discrimination, where they say, I expect that my unscattered counts have 511 kV, and I'm now going to reject counts which have too low energy. And so they have an energy window of maybe, let's say, 400 or 450 or whatever that it is kV, anything below that is bound to be a scattered and I'm going to throw it away. So that's one important thing that you need to know about your acquisition. And then you need to think about those two cases that I talked about already. And so there's a very close interaction between Compton uh, scatter and attenuation. And in some sense, what we do with attenuation correction is first we remove all the detected scatter and then we go back to the case where there was no scatter at all. Uh, so also that is often considered as a two-step process. Okay, so now again, this is, this is very brief because uh, we have some scatter estimation in STIR. Uh, the thing is then what happens at the detector front. Well, we need to think about detection efficiency, and that has uh, two components, really. One is our detector will sit there and it will uh, miss some of the photons that hit it with a certain probability. So we need to somehow measure that and, and characterize it. And once we have the uh, probability of detection for a single photon, then we need to think about probability of detection of the pair of photons. Uh, so there will be some additional effects that sometimes can happen. You can have some dead time in your circuitry or, or, uh, or whatever. Uh, so this detection efficiency modeling you need to do, and you need to do that based on some measurement. And it's often called normalization. And so what in practice people do is they split up this uh, detection model into different components. And so I've written a few down. Not everybody uses all of those. It depends again on, on your scanner and so on. And uh, a lot of them you will never see, but uh, those are sort of the main factors. And one of them, the epsilons i and j is what I talked about uh, initially as the detection efficiency for a single photon for each detector element. And then the rest is maybe what happens on the uh, pair front. So your, uh, you might have some offset in, in block timings. You might have some geometric effects. Uh, usually in efficiencies, people don't, they'll just take a global factor for the whole detector. They don't know where the photon comes from. So you, if you 
think about pairs. You do know where the photon comes from, and so often people stick that into what you call geometric effect. And then there is some dead time, and then there might be dwell time for rotating scanners or, or, or where you have motion and so on. So clearly, our, our problem is that we need to estimate all those variables from uh, measured data. And if, as it's written there, there are far too many, uh, many more than the measured data that we have. But so in practice, what we're going to do is have several measurements to determine those and impose certain things that we know about the scanner. And the, the biggest one there is symmetry. If you have a block detector, you can you know that geometric effects repeat itself if you rotate things as well. So, uh, so that reduces the number of factors. You can... Uh, then again stick this into some estimation process uh, that uses for instance maximum likelihood estimation uh, to estimate the underlying factors and so we have some some code for that in stir as well okay i hope that made some sense uh, so this is an example of uh, the detection efficiencies that you would get out of this of, a, of an old scanner and you you might see some of the uh, some a block pattern here where it is because this is a block detector scanner. Some of the blocks didn't do very well, and then you have some shading, which in this case was because of the holder for a for a line source that uh, was sitting in two two places in the scanner, and so therefore you would get lower efficiency for the detect for the gammas to hit those crystals. Uh, it's just a block detector for people who don't know that PET scanners are often organized by blocks. And those blocks are then often stacked into modules or, or buckets or whatever. And people use different names for that. Chris? Yes? Edo here. So in the previous slide, you said you had lower efficiency in this darker region because of the sample? Or so the, no, so the, this in this particular scanner, there, there was, uh, um, it, it's a scanner that had a line source that was able to rotate to estimate some of those normalization factors, but that line source is radioactive and they had to store it somewhere. And and for this scanner, this was an HR, uh, an HR plus the. Uh, line source was in a holder that was actually sitting in front of the crystals. Ah, okay. So it, physically, they constructed the scanner with something inside that right. hindered the the um, the detectors. Right. right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Right. And so that was shielding the yeah yeah sure um, the detectors obviously yeah. Um, Okay, so just to maybe visualize this a little bit, um, this is very, very old data inquired by Harry Spinks, uh, maybe 15 years ago on, on our HR plus that we had in Hammersmith at the time, and uh, of, of an Alderson phantom, and uh, just one bad position out of the whole thing where maybe you can sort of see the, the heart here in this case, and uh, a liver, below it and so the, the raw data that you get out people often talk about sinograms but in a 3d pet scanner it's often easier to think about what uh, in stir we call viewgrams it's sort of a projection along a plane it's not really strictly on a plane but in very good approximation um, and then you can uh, recognize shapes much easier than you can do in sinograms but you see lots of interesting things on this. You, you see some block patterns here clearly, and, and you see these diagonal lines, and they are actually the same thing that, that you see in the, the different perspectives. And if you reconstruct that data, well, your image looks pretty horrible, obviously. Um, Richard, maybe can you uh, tell Brian that the meeting is at three today? Um, okay, so 
Um, so you, you see all of the data sits really here, but nevertheless, there is a background and that background will be due to the random coincidences and the scatter. So uh, we will need to take all of this, all the stuff into account, but I've cut out some of the illustrations here, but this is an example. If you do use the detection efficiencies, and in this case, we normalize them. So we, we, we divide by the detection efficiencies, then it cleans up your projection data quite a lot. And obviously it cleans up your images as well. As well. So I'll just go back and forth. Yeah, so it's clear that you have to do this otherwise your results are very bad. And then this still has all the background. And so if you then do scatter estimation and randoms estimation, and you also do uh, then essentially attenuation correction to it, then the data, uh, you see the background in the sinograms is pretty much gone and your images become much more uniform, although in this case, sadly, still very noisy. Okay, so maybe that gives you a visual view of what happens if you don't take all of those things into account. And that would help if you want to check, did I do the normal, uh, the correct normalization, for instance, uh, or the correct scatter correction and randoms, you, all that background should be gone. That's much easier to see that in the projection data than, than it is in the acquisition. Okay, so now I think you have some basic idea of what uh, components there are in, uh, in um, how you model an acquisition process. And uh, the question is then, well, what pet data do we have? And so we had that picture on there before. So clearly, we are going to have our coincidences themselves. And so we call them the prompts, if you remember. Uh, and some scanners will measure the delays, not all of them. Um, this information can be stored either as uh, list mode data or projection data. So I, I list the STIR classes corresponding to this here. Uh, you can also, uh, pretty much all the scanners measure singles in some fashion. So the singles, I don't mean just the single events over here, but all of them, right? All hits on your detector that pass the energy window, uh, you will get uh, recorded. And that can be stored for every crystal or maybe only per block or maybe even per, per module or, or bucket that we called it. Um, that again, depends on your manufacturer and the timing information that you will have there as well is uh, either per second or uh, whatever, per five seconds or, or often in projection data, it's often just stored for the whole time frame. Hey, Chris. Uh, yep. Sorry, it's Ash here. Um, <clears throat> could you just remind us what a bucket is? Okay, so yeah, the com terminology there is, is probably a little bit non-standard, but uh, the uh, it, it's Siemens terminology and, and GE uses modules. So you, normally you have a you have a block with a bunch of crystals that are either cut or glued together, whatever. Uh, and those blocks are then uh, in, put in a module, uh, usually all parallel to each other, not on all scanners. And that is something that has its own uh, electronics behind it. And so those buckets are often sort of in a rectangular shape and they are then repeated in some fashion along the scanner. So that's just to say that initially I was thinking that you, you would need to know the block information and you repeat the blocks along the scanner, but in, in many cases, that's not correct. Uh, you need to know, know how those blocks are organized in a larger entity, which I call bucket here. So your scanner ring would be some polygon, uh, regular polygon, and it's just each arm of that. Right. Cool. And so 
some scanners will have uh, a repetition of buckets along the ring, but all some of them will also have several buckets in actual direction. And so have you, then you, it means you would have different spacing between your blocks uh, in actual direction as well, just to make life complicated. Uh, okay. So uh, that was already a lot of information, but then you also, to be able to do that time correction, you need to know have some estimate of what happened over there. And so uh, some give that information to you uh, per crystal. Some give it only per block or, or per bucket or whatever. Yes, depends on what their electronics is capable of doing. Um, you uh, also need to think about that time in the coincidence uh, processing, and that can just sometimes is a global number, or maybe it is one per bucket pair or, or whatever. Again, every manufacturer has their own capabilities. Some of them don't measure it at all. And uh, you then need to estimate it. How, what is your dead time? And so that can be done by doing measurements where you say, uh, I measure a phantom with different coincidence rate just by letting it decay. And then you see how does my detection efficiency change uh, depending on the count rate. And so the, what you then get are some model parameters stored somewhere and you need to give it some data. And most often the data that people give for that time information are the singles because most of the dead time sits on the uh, single detector level, but obviously you can have it on, on the pairs as well. Uh, okay. So those are measured data that you have, but in addition, you then have some other information aside from your prompts and delays and singles uh, and so on that you need to be able to do everything. And so uh, in so there is an exam info class that uh, gives you some information on timing and energy windows, patient positioning. There should be more in there. There isn't at the moment. It wouldn't be hard to add. Uh, the, uh, yeah, you need to know something about geometry, like the blockets and buckets and all of that, and gantry alignment, which I talked about earlier as well. And uh, in addition, you then need to have information on, on all, all of the parameters. So, and in particular, there's information on calibration that often sits in what people call normalization files. So this is related to detection efficiencies. And normalization uh, is, well, in some comp usually component-based format, they will be storing the things that we talked about in one of the previous slides. In addition, there will then often be a global calibration factor that says, okay, you've done your best, now compare it to uh, a known activity, uh, for instance, that you check with a well counter or, or an iron chamber, and that gives you then a global calibration factor on, on top of all the stuff. Uh, Clearly, you need the information on attenuation, either as an image or as uh, uh, projection data itself. And somewhat confusingly, in because in uh, PET, all of those end up as uh, projection data or a sinogram. They uh, are, can all be processed using the bin normalization class in in STIR, so you, you would have bin normalization that takes into account attenuation, bin normalization that takes into account detection efficiency, maybe another one for uh, calibration, and then in the end, you will multiply effectively all of those to get you the correct result. Good, so um, I've talked a little bit, so th this is a bit of an aside uh, about placement of detectors and, and blocks and whatever. So you often have some 
kind of gap between those, the spacing between the crystals in a block is much narrower than the ones between the blocks themselves. Um, and so you can, you can handle that in different ways. So if you, if you don't do anything at all, uh, which your current stir projectors would be doing, you're going to make some mistake on the positioning of all the events, clearly. That's not ideal. Uh, ideally, you do know about the detector position. And so that's uh, by a full request. And you need then to give the information to your reconstruction package or, or the, the position modeling bit of it. Uh, where is every crystal and whatever. And from there on, everything remains the same. Or you can do a trick that is used by Siemens and they, they sort of uh, um, made a, a compromise where they say, I'm going to, my, my gaps between detectors is roughly the same size as a crystal, not quite, but roughly. And so uh, we are going to insert a, a virtual or a dummy crystal in my projection data and they will never get any counts. But if I do that, then I can go back to the first point and ignore it that there are actually any gaps. And I can again assume that all my crystals are just sitting on the ring. And so that is how we handle uh, Siemens data at the moment. It comes that way. We know about it. We, we put in the gaps in the normalization. We know that there are no counts and everything is fine from there. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, modeling pet data is quite complicated really. And many people think about, ah, oh, once I know about line integrants, I'm done. That's unfortunately not the case. Um, that's clearly true for any modality. So it's much more going on behind the scenes. Uh, so in STIR, we aim to be able to do all of the processing uh, ourselves, we try and rely as little as possible on the manufacturer. Um, that some cases we are uh, further along the road than for other scanners. And uh, so this week in our virtual hackathon, we'll try and make some, some progress again on that. Um, it's complicated because you need to know the information from the scanner. And if they don't tell you, then essentially you can't know. So. Uh, we're, we're lucky that some of the manufacturers are willing to give that information to us. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about uh, sort of as an introduction for the next topics. Uh, any questions? Okay. Great. So again, feel free to ask uh, questions later on as well. Um, I, oh, I see a, a chat. Um, uh, I guess this was about uh, delayed versus random. Uh, Peter, your your comment uh, from a bit ago that there, you didn't see any difference between the uh, delayed and, and random coincidences. Uh, clearly, it depends on what the manufacturer can do. So now GE doesn't give you the delayed option anymore because it means they need to have extra uh, circuitry which they dispense with. Um, okay, great. So our uh, next talk uh, will be by uh, Palak. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the next talk is by Robbie, uh, Robbie Twyman at UCL. Um, I don't know if you can try and share Robbie on um, some software he's been uh, writing based on, on work from many, many others uh, on uh, connecting STIR and gates. So, yeah, go ahead, Robbie. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I started sharing and then I couldn't find Zoom to unmute. Yeah, yeah. it's working okay now. Good, you can all see. Excellent. Yep. Um, okay, so I'd just like to talk about the Stargate Connection project that I've been working on for a while. Uh, the motivation for this project was 
there are a number of us obviously at UCL that have been using gate uh, to generate data for stir and what we were finding was it was getting put uh, it was starting to be put into different directories repositories and so this project is an attempt to kind of bring all of that work together and into one common place which hopefully sort of streamlines the process and can easily be built upon uh, this work isn't just developed by me. A lot of it was done by previous PhD students at UCL. Uh, so what is GATE? Uh, in a, I'm not going to do it justice, but it's a Monte Carlo simulation for emission tomography. Uh, it's built upon the GM4 uh, simulation, uh, simulation toolkit. I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm not going to do it justice, but essentially it allows you to uh, simulate photon emissions uh, in a PET scanner, in a simulated PET scanner, and record and measure uh, detections of photons, uh, put them into coincidence uh, bins, and allows for uh, the acquisition of data in a simulated space where the true activity is known, for example. Uh, so it's a very high-powered Monte Carlo toolkit. So the purpose of this Stirgate connection is to, in a sense, to streamline the process of creating a voxelized phantom and attenuation using Stir functionality. Uh, or a user could insert something such as an XCAT volume and attenuation. Uh, that both have worked, have been shown to work. Uh, we wish to set up and run gate simulations in cluster array jobs. Uh, typically these uh, indices by a unique variable and we'll build upon that in a second. And then combine and unlist root files uh, from one root file is produced by each gate simulation. And we wish to unlist each of these root files for reconstruction in STIR. Uh, so to set up the simulation, we currently have two options. Uh, one is a Siemens MNR, which has been validated, and a Discovery uh, G Discovery 690. So currently, the user will specify which of the two systems they wish to scan with, and we, uh, and then it will copy all the correct files into the correct directories for the simulations. Uh, we wish to uh, then the user has the option to pass a a uh, star image or a star parameter file and the, uh, the scripts will automatically create that using star functionality. It also modifies the attenuation to be of the correct type, just if this is a gate thing. Uh, we'll talk, we may talk about that in a bit. And thirdly, uh, it will set up a DMAP. This is again a gate thing uh, for parallel jobs. We don't wish to create more than one density map right now. So then we have a script called run gate, and this is really simple. Uh, it's intended to be equivalent between all simulations uh, at the moment, and is each simulation it just has this unique identifying variable called task ID uh, on a typical cluster computing system. When you're doing array jobs, this will be indices for you. And you can just set that as whichever parallel or array indices that is. And then the real, uh, the real bit of work uh, done by this set of scripts in this project is the computation or collection of various gate variables from the interfile headers. headers. Uh, there are three here that I've taken the examples of, but uh, when setting up gate simulations and setting up the activity and attenuation uh, phantoms in the scanner, you have to give them things like uh, the position of the, the source position or the attenuation translation, uh, the correct voxel sizes and uh, the number of voxels. And so this information is all available in the interfile headers created by STIR. So there are just simple uh, scripts that read the interfile headers and then will automatically collect these variables and insert them into gate for you or the gate macro scripts for you. Uh, 
this is, essentially means all you have to provide run gate is a few variables, one of which being the interfile headers and the uh, unique identifiers, the timeframes, things like that. So it really is a very simple uh, set of scripts to run gate. Robbie? Yes. Uh, could I ask two questions? Um, one, uh, did you say both the Siemens MMR and the Discovery 690 were both um, validated? The MMR was validated previously, yes. The Discovery uh, is, I'm still not convinced it's quite right. And mm -hmm. work definitely needs to go into validating that. But it, it's close. It gives a reasonable number of count. It gives the reasonable number of coincidences. And um, uh, the second one, if you jump forward um, a slide, um, do you have any feeling, or maybe Chris could jump in, whether um, my geometry stuff will affect this computation of the X, Y, Z of um, detector elements? I am not familiar with your geometry. Yeah, stuff. no, it, it shouldn't really. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, at the moment, in the way we read root files, there is an extra field that allows you to rotate things around, along the scanner. And ideally, we would get rid of that. You, you would specify it in, in another way. And uh, also, there is no uh, bed position information in all of this. So uh, in, in that sense, yes, the if we would make our coordinate system completely backwards compatible, then there should be no change. If we decide to move our zero somewhere else, then obviously we would need to change this as well. So at the moment, this follows the, the stir conventions of centering your image into the scanner and then getting on with it, but taking, taking the actual uh, uh, non-intuitive stir conventions into account as far as if you have even sized number of things and so on. But it, so it takes care of all of them. Using yeah. stir functionality. So if we change it such that stir functionality still works for your stuff, then this stuff should keep on working. Uh, I had a, a comment on validating. So uh, we are not in the business of uh, tuning gate macro files and whatever, such that it's actually validated, like you read the gate papers where you they have put in correct that time modeling and they have extra information about where their uh, shielding is and all of that. So that none of that is in here. We obviously hope that the gate community will uh, contribute some of their validated macros to us and then all of the rest should just work. Yeah. Sorry, thanks for the color clarification on the validation. Yeah, it is not validated in that sense. It's, uh, I guess what I meant was it's, checked in a sense that the the sinograms look re, uh, are comparable to what stir outputs right no. uh, yes so sorry yeah makes sense it's better than starting from scratch if you're going to use one of those scanners yeah and uh definitely needs building upon uh, if you want to if you want realistic truly realistic simulations then a little bit more work into putting into it but yeah uh, just after monte carlo simulation this is okay, I think. Uh, so just moving on to unlisting. Uh, this uses the stirs lm to proj data functionality uh, for the root file. Uh, this can automatically, uh, all you have to do is provide it the root file. It will populate the age root uh, template which, and parameter file for the lm to project data. Uh, this information is collected earlier on and is scanner specific. Uh, we current, there are, I'm not sure this is actually implemented quite yet, but there's a pull request for it. Uh, there's two methods to unlist due to the parallel jobs. One is to combine your, all your root files from your parallel simulations uh, and then unlist that large root file. And the other is to unlist each job's root file and then just sum the sinograms up. Uh, we're leaving this up to user's choice because 
data files with root files can get a little unwieldy and it, or even sinograms they get quite large so it's just user's choice and hopefully documentation will reflect that uh, we have a quick check built into all of this to visualize what the uh, what everything looks like using the gate QT uh, flag. Uh, this allows you to visualize the scanner geometry, so the crystals, the blocks, and the buckets. I think this is the uh, Discovery 690 scanner here. Uh, I'm not going to show talk about that too much, but. Um, it allows for checking of the phantom position in attenuation for the attenuation and also a CD emission of the photons. And so here there's a point source zero, zero, zero. And you can see the emission of the photons in A. And I don't know why the white is there. Uh, and again, validation, this is wrong, but uh, we have, so this is just to demonstrate that the center is set up. So this is our stir parameter file uh, this, and so it is at center, the origin is at zero, zero and X and Y, and it is at the middle of the a voxelized phantom in or close enough to the middle. It's not quite, uh, but, uh, close enough to the center of the fox, the phantom created by stir and looking at the root file, we can see that it's pretty dead on center. And this is actually the correct value based upon what we have. Uh, so for future work, this project's a little bit young still, so we're still looking to improve. There's quite some, there's a few big changes to come in. Uh, again, validation is not the correct word here, perhaps, but point source checks to ensure center. We wish to sort of automate these processes to check and compare with STIR, and just to see if everything we're doing with geometries and uh, phantoms is correct. Uh, we need better tests on the scripts just to ensure that if there is an error, it errors properly. This is in a, in a pull request. Uh, one of the ideas we wish to have to introduce generalized uh, pet geometries is to actually construct a gate geometry from the star into file headers. Uh, we're not sure how easy that will be. It's probably not very easy. Uh, but we could just read the sinogram header files and see and see if we can construct something. Uh, again, more scanner geometry files. These two are kind of linked. Uh, currently, the MMR scanner we have uh, has this virtual crystal as a physical crystal, and so one of the to dos is to actually remove this extra crystal but this requires stir mods to insert the virtual crystal if that makes sense and finally improve the documentation uh, so hopefully that's giving you an insight of what of this little project that we've got going uh, we really do welcome contributions and any comments are useful uh, this hasn't been tested by many people right now besides me uh, so a little bit of help would go a long way and any any input is probably I haven't heard it before. Uh, I'd like to thank all the authors of, the, of what this works based upon, at least with Rebecca, Vanessa and Chris and acknowledge Catherine and Anna. Thank you. Any questions? Nope. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I had a question about uh, Edo here. So it seems that you have a bunch of executables, basically. Is is it user friendly? A uh, bunch of ex. <laughs> I I, th I think I think it's stir is the same, right? Uh, it's it's all written in shell, uh, so it's just lots of shell scripts. Uh, so yes, it is. There is an example that gives a pretty clear. It it does break it down into these kind of three steps is one function, set of functionality creates the voxelized phantom. The other, well, there's a setup for stir, uh, sorry, setup of the D map and things like that as a run gate and then there's unlisting. It, it, 
if you follow these three points, it is kind it is fairly user friendly, but I mean, again, I'm the only one that's really tested it. So it's very user friendly because I've created it. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm just thinking of a poor user that gets to use it. And I mean, it's just a general question if, if you think that would be the uh, then point. So you want to create a bunch of executable that the user will have to execute in, in steps or there is something, I don't know, more unified where you can say, oh, I want, you know, one single program that does the three steps. I don't know. I mean. Yeah. So it, it gets a little bit complicated. You can't really have, you can do it for one simulation. Uh, so essentially one parallel job on its own. Uh, with array jobs, though, it becomes a little bit complicated to have more than, to have everything done in one script because you end up waiting for array jobs to finish and things like that. So yes, it's not the easiest thing to kind of demonstrate in for array jobs, but for a sync, there is an example that does, creates the phantom, does all of this, all of these steps in one go. All you have to do is give it, it's called the example, which is here, example star gate. Um, yeah, I, I think I'd also like to make a, uh, okay, we, we, we did, there are no executables in this project. There's all, only shell scripts. We could have done it via Python, but uh, then we would have had to choose between stir Python and surf Python and whatever. And, and in the end, many people are, are probably also familiar with shell scripts. Now, there is, there's far too many things here that people want to change. They want to change their scanner templates. They want to change their, their gate setup, whatever, which is, you can make horribly complicated if you want to. So there is no, I, I believe at this point in time anyway, no, no good motivation to make one, one thing that does it all because it, it's just far too complicated. Uh, what we want to do is to give a, a number of things that help people do what they what they would want to do. And if you if you are just want to run a gate simulation for a predefined scanner, then it's nice and easy. If you want to modify it, it all of the all of the information is there to be able for you to modify and, and see what it does. It, it's different from. Uh, there's nothing modular or, or whatever here. It's, it just doesn't work that way. Now, obviously, once you have your gate simulation done, then you can use normal stir or surf or whatever that uh, to reconstruct the data. Then it doesn't need to know anything anymore. Once you've run this, you, we can we can do our usual well-designed software at this point. Yeah, yeah I was just being uh, teasing a bit, but. <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, user friendliness that again comments and contributions because, like I say, I'm the only one that's really tested it. I so I know what I'm doing. Uh, if you have any user input or information that would help me, then that would be really useful. Or even just contribute it yourself. That um, yeah. pull requesting. Yeah, no, no, just just my. In my experience, the first time I gave a, a GUI to somebody else, they managed to crash it at the second click because they didn't think I, as I did. So it's always very difficult to give somebody a piece of software to use. So yeah, yeah. I agree that you, yeah, if you have some feedback for from somebody, it's going to be better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Hi, sorry, I'm Harry here from uh, oh, University hi. of Sydney. Um, I just have a question about the um, output file format of um, the voxelized phantom. Um, so you feed it a stir reconstructed image and it, what is the output of the um, voxelized phantom? So if, if, if you feed it some image file, in, uh, stir into file uh, image format, what is the voxelized phantom output format for, for, for input into gate? Uh, so it, you wouldn't really pass it a reconstructed image. It would more likely be a, uh, a sort of source, 
uh, emission sure. file and attenuation. Yeah, so it's in the STRS HV and V uh, oh. interval. Actually, sure, but for um, well. input into gate, what is that file file format? Sorry, Chris, but you. So, okay, so the, the way it's set up is that uh, because this is supposed to be run by other people, yes. So you can you can input any image that Stir will read any file format, whatever. But gate doesn't do that. So what we do is we create it. We create a interfile copy of that in the appropriate uh, header, whatever that gate needs, and they give that to my, to the gate macro. Now, I know gate can these days read MHD, so maybe at some point people should shift that, but that's what it does right now. So it makes a copy of your input images, and mm. it will make that copy in a way it knows about stir conventions for geometry, and it assumes that your GE, uh, sorry, uh, your gate macro is for a scanner that is centered at zero, and then it will do everything. So the the voxelized phantom um, input into gate is um, dot mhd. It at the no at the moment it's interface it's h three three. Yeah. Okay. All right, okay. Yeah, but if anybody knows how to do it with MHD, I'd um, be very happy to consider that because that interfile reader is a bit nonsense. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I saw a question, can you do uh, PEM uh, from gate simulation? So the, this, this stuff is not a gate, uh, whatever, all, all singing and dancing thing. You still need to do your own gate stuff and, and you would still, uh, at the moment, you need to then see how does my uh, stir in scanner correspond to whatever I implement into gate, and you need to do that yourself right now. Uh, but as, as long as you can simulate PEM with stir, and you can do it with gate. So if, if you have those two matching up, then this stuff will make your life easier. That's, that's all it does. No magic proof. Sorry, Chris, I didn't quite understand that. Does I I thought um, that this script would generate your um, geometry for gate from? No, it doesn't your, yet. You, okay, you have so. to create that right now yourself. Okay. It wouldn't be hard to say I know what Stir thinks about geometry, and then uh, write the corresponding gate geometry macros. It wouldn't be very hard to do, but it doesn't do it yet. Okay. So those are provided as templates, but then this stuff takes care of centering and putting everything in the correct place and generating voxel size information and whatever. Mm -hmm. You can modify your images and so on. And, and uh, yeah. Okay, I think we do need to move on. Obviously, the aim is that in the hackathon, a few of you try this and give some feedback and say, this is suitable or, or, or not. Yeah. Okay, Palak. Um, yeah. We are running a bit over time. Uh, unfortunately, apologies for that. I, I hope it's okay for people to uh, keep on going for roughly another half an hour. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Okay. So basically, I have been uh, involved with um, uh, CCP PET MR to incorporate the G Signa PET MR scanner, the PET part of the scanner within STIR. So my talk is about uh, G RDF9 support within STIR. Uh, so what I have done is that I made um, all the implementations for G Signa PET data to uh, read and um, calculate the uh, emission and correction sinograms and then reconstruct data with STIR. And uh, this talk also touches uh, the future, uh, the current work which we, uh, we are doing, uh, basically Ander is doing and we are doing, I'm helping uh, with him uh, to incorporate uh, G discovery or other G scanners to make it more general. 
so um, right. Uh, G scanner basically stores all the pets raw data which um, is coming out after a scan, which uh, I will also call acquisition data in RDF format. It's, it's particular format. It's uh, the only way which was possible before this work to read this format was through the proprietary software that GE provides, which is a closed source software. So this works makes uh, it uh, open source. And if you don't have um, GE toolbox, you can still reconstruct, but uh, we are missing some components here uh, right now. So depending on which scanner, G scanner you have, the version of RDF can change. For example, G Sigma PetMR, which I was dealing with, had RDF9 format and G Discovery MI, it stores RDF9 or 10. Uh, G Discovery 710 uh, has both uh, 9 and 10, as well as uh, it also have RDF8. So this all depends on what scanner software version is so it gets updated and you you may have a new rdf uh, version for um, for the acquisition data that you're getting out of the scanner so from rdf9 the file format was based on hierarchical data format 5 uh, so which is also called hdf5 so all the data, all the essential data which we require is basically stored within HDF5 file format. So it has, um, we can view this HDF5 using a viewer, HDF5 uh, viewer, and um, you can see the header info. You can also see the actual data within, which is stored within this HDF5 file. Um, STIR version 4.0 has no RDF support, whereas uh, now release 4 and master branch has RDF 9 support only for Cigna PetMR because I hardwired uh, the PetMR values. Uh, now Ender is uh, work, working on uh, generalizing this to support other scanners, which will be coming within GE RDF 9 branch. So, uh, a few examples of what uh, GRDF9 files are, which come out of the scanner, includes uncompressed sinogram, normalization, geometric correction files, and uh, so on. So uh, now I will um, just uh, summarize a little bit about hierarchical data format. So all the data that is required, which we need to read, is stored in HDF5 file format and we need to use uh, C++ tools to extract the information that we need. So HDF5 is basically open source file format that contains header and data as a tree structure. And there are tools uh, within H5 uh, library which can be used to read the entire data or even you can have excess subsets of the stored data uh, which can be used for further manipulations, which would be required uh, to do data corrections. So, HDF5 uh, data needs to be read with using uh, particular steps um, in order to read it within STIR. So, first we need to open the particular data set that we need from the HDF5 file. For example, if you need emission data, you will open the list data in the list mode file and you read all the contents that you need and you store it as an output in STIR. So um, there are H5 functions available to open the data set and we use address of the data field from HDF5 file and um, we open this data set, uh, then we allocate a uh, memory, uh, which basically is defined according to the dimensions of the data that we need to read. And then we finally read this data, store it as an output buffer. Uh, we also define the data space for the output. And then we can 
use this and we can calculate our sinograms within STIR. So this, uh, these all steps, uh, we have a dedicated class uh, called GEHDF5 wrapper.cxs, which basically does all these steps for the different files, for example, list mode, um, normalization, and geometric um, correction files. It opens the data which we need uh, and then re uh, gives the output. So for G scanners, we need uh, particularly these uh, uh, uncompressed sinogram, uncompressed list mode, and um, calibration files such as norm 3D, geo 3D, and WCC 3D files in order to, as inputs, in order to actually extract the information. So the uh, single information is basically extracted from the list, uncompressed list mode file. And the date time information can also be extracted from this uncompressed list mode file. Uh, if the file is compressed, uh, we would need to get it uncompressed from the scanner. Uh, other, otherwise, the implementations won't work. So uh, this is an overview how you can include the geometry of the G scanner within STIR. So scanner parameters are generally included within scanner.cxx class with these list of uh, these parameters. So these parameters are generally available in published papers, or you can also use the header information from the HDF5 file to fill up these information. So once you have um, introduced your scanner within STIR, then you can uh, basically further read uh, your um, emission and data corrections and expect that at least the few dimensions would be accurate. So uh, further, here is an overview. How would you incorporate um, a GE scanner within STIR? So we have this GE HDF5 wrapper class. So if you have a, a acquisition data, you need to have um, functions within GHDF5 wrapper, which would access the data using address. Uh, then you will initialize the data space, you will read the data, and then you will store it as output. Then, there, then you will uh, calculate the sinograms from whatever data you have in output. And um, th uh, this can be done in other classes generally. For example, for uh, list mode information, you will use C list mode data from GHDF5. For um, single rates, you will use single rates and so on. And finally, you will ha uh, have another utility which will write out the sinograms for, to be used as inputs within your reconstruction parameter file. And uh, an example for this is construct randoms from G singles. Basically, it uh, reads the single rate information from here and um, does all the calculation within this class to get accurately the random rates using the formula that uh, Chris described in his um, um, presentation today. So uh, this slide uh, gives you an example of reading list mode data. So we, as I said that we require uncompressed list mode file. So we have that uncompressed list mode file. From there, we can uh, read the list, the uh, data using GHDF5 wrapper, then we can implement uh, encoding of record to crystal ring time of life info using GC list mode, uh, sorry, C list mode data G signal class. And then finally, we can use um, utilities such as uh, LM to proj data to get stir projection data, or you can use this directly, the list mode file to do list mode reconstruction. Now, um, this would uh, this sounds simple, but it's a bit complicated with real scanners because uh, you need to take into account that you're working with accurate, uh, uh, like whatever crystal numbers you're reading, is it accurate within stir space? 
So you need to uh, make ensure that all the information that you are reading is accurate within search space, which requires quite a lot of intensive testing. Um, in this slide, slide, I have an example of how we can read random corrections. So for my case, for GE Sigma, I accessed uh, the single rates from list mode file, and I uh, read it within, within GHDF pipe wrapper. Then I stored these within single rates from GHDF pipe class, and then I calculate the, calculated uh, random sinograms by basically multiplying uh, the single rates which I stored in this class with uh, two tau, which is um, the tau is the uh, coincidence uh, with um, the time window of the scanner. Here I show an example of how I implemented normalization correction. I read norm factors within uh, the wrapper class then I calculated um, the correction factors for each bin within bin normalization class. And then finally, we can use correct proj data to do uh, to basically get the sinograms. Here is an example workflow. After you have done all the implementation, you've included your scanner geometry, you have read your data set, uh, your uh, emission and um, correction data, and you have calculated uh, the correction factors, you can basically use LM2 Proj data to get uh, sinogram. Then you can use correct Proj data to get normalization sinogram. You can use this utility, particularly for G, to get random sinogram. And uh, in G scanners, we need to rotate our MRAC image. This is because um, the by uh, the zero y zero is not identical for g and for stir so we need to take into account a view offset uh, hopefully this will be as chris said we will have in version uh, in release 5.0 we will have this so you won't need to rotate mrac image anymore you can use pre existing utility uh, calculate attenuation coefficients to calculate attenuation sinograms and finally, you can do scatter correction using single scatter simulation. Currently, we don't have time of light scatter correction implemented, um, but um, I mean, uh, hopefully we have in future. So here is an example of uh, the comparisons that we, I have done for my data set. So this is a VQC phantom, uh, which is volumetric quality control phantom data. It comprises of point sources. So I extracted the emission sinogram from my um, code, uh, STIR, and from the toolbox, which is uh, provided by GE. And we saw that these both arrays were identical. I subtracted. So basically, the implementations that we have currently for GE Signal works. I repeated the same comparison for normalization and randoms. There are very minor differences between normalization and randoms. This is because we don't really implement uh, dead time uh, correction currently or decay correction within randoms, but uh, it shouldn't make a lot of difference. Anyways, the difference is quite small. So this is the list uh, which we are hoping to tackle during this hackathon. So the tasks which we have um, scheduled to tackle is that we will read the geometric factors directly within bin normalization. Then we will test our current implementation for randoms correction. It's because uh, we, um, under has made it more uh, general, so we need to correct, uh, test the current implementations. We will also upload a phantom data set from G Sigma PetMR on Zenodo. We will upload uh, emission and norm sinograms converted into STIR from Toolbox on Zenodo to compare uh, with all of, of the implementations that will be done then we will in also need to incorporate some simple tests to see what uh, if we have uh, same number of counts 
within CERN and Toolbox, and we will compare other um, sim basic things such as single arrays. Uh, finally, uh, to do more accurate um, tests, we will basically compare the sinograms that we uploaded on Zenodo with the ones that we calculate with the code, and hopefully this is an exhaustive list, but I think that we would uh, like to have more input of what else we can include to test our code. And finally, we will create some example scripts for G um, scanners. We have a VQC Phantom dataset, which we are planning to upload on Zenodo. It will include uncompressed list mode uh, file, some, uh, some RPDC files, and uh, reconstructed images for PET and MR. And we also have uh, one phantom data set from Discovery MI in RDF9. We might not be able to upload it on share uh, only. Further, we will also upload some sinograms as test data. And uh, this is an example on how currently we have organized the tests for unlisting in STIR. We will basically um, use lm 2 proj data to unlist um, the list uncompressed list mode file, get STIR sinogram, and compare it with the sinogram on Zenodo. Also see if it has um, total number of counts are equal. Similarly, we will have test for randoms and normalization sinograms. Um, of course, more input is welcome on tests. That's it, thank you. Uh, any questions? Yeah, great, Panak, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I just have a, a comment um regarding getting data from the scanner so um on the scanner it is stored as rdf somewhere but it's kind of hard to find so ge has some tools for exporting data now what they do is they uh, wrap it in some dicom files similar to what siemens and others do and so i've recently uh incorporated some work in our PET RD2 separate project uh, to extract the data from GE uh, raw PET DICOM files, the RPDCs, so that you get the RDFs out from there. So that doesn't sit in stir for various reasons, uh, but so you have to run that first, you get your RDFs and then stir runs from there. Okay. So it will be interesting to hear later, um, see if people can contribute some RDF9 data, uh, phantom data ideally that we could add to our uh, test uh, set. Okay, any further comments, questions? No, in that case, I think uh, we'll pass to George. Uh, thanks, Chris. And let me just share share my screen. Yep, seems to be working okay. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, I haven't um, I haven't really spoken to or met anyone else in the in this uh, uh, meeting. So, hi, I'm I'm George. I'm a PhD student with the um, University of Manchester and uh, Christy. Uh, based in Manchester as well. Um, I was just going to sort of talk through my project, so what I'm, what I'm doing and um, yeah, hopefully see sort of what, how, how I could use STIR and how this sort of fits into the sort of the hackathon uh, aims over the next few days. So yeah, so uh, I, I've, I've adapted this talk from a, another one I did recently. So if, um, if anything doesn't make sense, please just you know feel free to ask questions or anything. That's that's absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, so we're talking about establishing the reproducibility of radiometric heterogeneity metrics with the uh, gate simulations and three D printed phantoms. 
So obviously we know that the PET is, is by its nature a very, it's a quantitative imaging process um, where um, our pixel values give the activity concentration that we calculate to have emanated from a particular space on the patient. Um, this numerical information can be thought of as like a distribution just like any other and can tell us quite a lot about how a tumour is behaving. For instance, the shape of a tumour might be indicative of its aggressiveness or the heterogeneity of the uptake throughout a tumour might tell us how a tumour is responding to radiotherapy. Um, the study of statistically quantifying these properties from a medical image is known as radiomics and it's one of the fastest growing fields in modern medicine, uh, accelerated by the current um, revolution in data science and machine learning. Um, on the academia side of things, as on um, uh, this uh, little plot on the right hand side showing just hits on Google Scholar by year of paper release, um, you can see it's sort of exponentially growing uh, on the academia side of things. Um, as sort of a growing number of research projects use these radiomic statistics to find new ways to stratify patient data sets by diagnosis, by prognosis, how patients respond to treatment, etc. Uh, there are a huge number of software packages, both proprietary and open source, that will extract radiomic features from your medical images, and companies are using these statistics to create new and exciting products to help improve diagnosis of cancer or help define more complex irradiation volumes for radiotherapy. Um, so ever more financially rewarding contracts being provided to these companies by trusts and hospitals all over the globe to sort of help improve existing technical abilities with defining you know, aforementioned precision radiotherapy and establishing better patient treatment protocols. But the big issue surrounding all of this is that basically since its inception, uh, radiomics has struggled in PET and well, all other imaging modalities. Uh, They've struggled with uh, including uncertainties and errors in image metrics. So they're rarely, if ever, even offered by software packages and kind of even tougher to work out by itself. And there are many reasons for this, which can be split into two broader topics. So inherent inaccuracies in the PET process, which is Chris touched on earlier, and I'm sure you'll all be familiar. Then you've also got the complexity of, of the metrics themselves. So when talking about image metrics, it's useful to divide them into three broad categories. So you've got metrics which describe the uptake, the shape, and the heterogeneity of a region of interest. Uh, uptake metrics, as you will know, describe the activity concentration in each voxel, and typically in kilobecks per mil, but this often lacks context. So you know, where more activity is administered to a patient and on their size or what you're trying to image, it's common to normalize this in some manner. So if you normalize it to the injector value, it's the SUV or standardized uptake value. Uh, shape metrics um, describe you know, the shape of a region of interest. So it can be described statistically by familiar metrics such as the volume and surface area, but also the sphericity, the elongation, the flatness. You know, these are all mathematical features you can extract from. You know, the box size shape of your region of interest. Um, these become complicated by the voxelized nature of your isolated region of interest. So it's common for different algorithms to be applied to interpolate the space between voxels to, um, to account for this, really. Um, so finally, heterogeneity is more tricky to define, but is probably the most useful concept that radiomics tries to tackle. And the concept itself is rather vague, as, as many metrics can realistically describe a distribution of pixel values. Uh, the simplest are often described as first order metrics, so these the mean, the standard deviation, etc. Uh, and these are problematic if you want to sort of develop a nuanced take on uh, the distribution of activity throughout your region as they're heavily influenced by noise in the data and provide very little by way of spatial information. So you need more detailed metrics if you want to describe a distribution's unique patterns and features. 
uh, and more modern image analysis introduces texture matrices that are derived from the original image. So most radiomics packages will calculate the connectivity matrix, the size zone matrix, amongst others, by first splitting the image into discrete gray levels. And then higher order metrics are calculated from these matrices. Now, for instance, if the gray level size zone matrix tells you how many groups of different sizes of similarly valued pixels there are, your small area emphasis is an example of a statistic that is larger if there's a tendency for small size pixel groups in your ROI. So for instance, the left hand side over the right. Um, so the common underlying issue experienced in all of this is the lack of standardization across the industry and the research field. Uh, different centers use different protocols for image reconstruction and data correction, but each individual scan may necessitate a different approach to reconstruction. Um, different centers use different approaches for defining regions of interest on images. Uh, different image analysis software packages use different algorithms to extract image metrics. Um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when there are this many variables, it becomes very difficult to begin to establish the reliability and the reproducibility of the radial metrics being used. You know, especially as they're going to guide the future of nuclear medicine, really. Um, yeah. So more on to my project. So the experiment I'm currently working on is an effort to establish some degree of reproducibility in radiomic heterogeneity metrics. So we're going to do this by using the noise equivalent count rate, or the NECR, which is a statistic that estimates the number of counts from a Poisson distribution that would give the same noise that you experience in your data. So we hypothesize that the NECR measured increases uh, with the activity present until it reaches a, a maximum um, where it sort of tails off after this. So this is due to the increased activity beyond here, overloading the timing result. It would help if I put the equation up on There we go. Um, yeah, so we hypothesize that the uh, NECR measured increases with the activity until it reaches a maximum. Obviously, as you increase the activity, uh, all of these three are going to, going to increase at a certain rate, but then you'll hit a theoretical maximum beyond which the uh, scanner itself is going to um, going to hinder you so your increased activity up overloads the timing resolution of the detector for various reasons talked about earlier you know, dead time you know, signal processing what have you uh, from then on more and more of these true coincidences are going to be um, denoted as, as being random um, and as such you'd expect measures of noise that you extract from your image to sort of echo this pattern uh, and as this plot shows, um, courtesy of, of, of Pete, Pete Julian, um, this um, the percentage integral uniformity, just a, essentially a, a measure of the the range of your pixel values, it, it echoes this. Uh, you know, the nadir of one uh, of the image uh, metric uh, occurs at the same activity as the peak in your NECR. Um, so this then could form the basis of a reproducibility test for heterogeneity metrics, as the heterogeneity of a region of interest should really be independent of the noise experience. And you should really be able to obtain the shape of the underlying activity distribution when imaging at as low an activity as possible. So in our experiment, we're going to aim to construct a framework with the use of Monte Carlo simulation and 3D printed phantoms. Um, we can print 3D uh, tumors from real patient CT data, fill them with a known activity, a known shape, and a known heterogeneity of distribution. Uh, with GATE, um, as mentioned earlier, it, it's, uh, we're able to carefully define our underlying voxelized activity distributions while tracking each individual photon for accurate scatter or random categorization. Um, we have the ability in our department to simulate on a, a fairly large computer cluster with around 660 cores. 
Um, plans are underway to use the university's um, own system with about 14,000. Um, so these can be used to verify real patient data once validated uh, with comparison to the 3D printed lesions. And from here, um, you know, the world's our oyster. Really, we want to be able to test as many different types, uh, different shapes and sizes and activity distributions sort of, uh, with different heterogeneities of all types of tumours. And that really is going to be only possible using simulation. Um, so obviously this experiment is due to be done in several stages and first of all we require a test with standard geometries to see if the changing activity and image noise affects different heterogeneity metrics in the way we expect. So as such we aim to perform you know, initial tests on a perspex cylinder filled with F18, uh, 20 centimetres in diameter and 20 centimetres at length, so basically filling the extent of the scanner. Um, following a positive result we'll sort of start <laughs> we'll start our uh, 3D printed um, phantoms. Um, shape and size will be key factors when considering these metrics, as in a lot of cases, these are non independent factors. So, without wanting to labour the point too much, our, our first tests were due to take place just before lockdown. Um, so, the results I'm sort of showing are unverified with experimental data. But as we can see from this simulation that we, we experienced the, um, the characteristic curve shown in the, the previous example. Um, yeah, from here, we, we're aiming to validate this by filling the cylinder with up to uh, one gigabecker of activity and just leaving to decay in the scanner over several half-lives. Uh, and this is where, this is where STIR comes in. Um, as the second part of the simulated data obviously involves reconstructing images. And as we're using a, a Siemens uh, Biograph MCT, um, this has not been achieved with sort of the desired level of accuracy as we'd like, and that's largely down to the virtual crystal arrangement. We, we're unable to um, achieve a, a uh, image reconstruction that is um, as accurate as we'd like, largely because when we're using these metrics, we need to be as close as possible to something that's realistic. And if the um, the, the uh, size of our um, tumors is obviously quite small, even minute changes in, in voxel size, which will happen if we're uh, using different numbers of slices, it's going to be um, it's going to be difficult to achieve the sort of desired level of accuracy. Um, so yeah, so uh, analysis is currently underway of patient data to develop heterogeneous tumor phantoms um, with a sort of a full statistical analysis um, of radiometric metrics on the way. Um, it's uh, still in its early stages, so. You know, as, as these meetings go on, I'd love to sort of come back and keep sharing stuff with with uh, people who work with STIR. Uh, I think, yeah, it's, there's some real um, exciting potential here. Um, so, yeah, I just want to reinforce that um, there's, uh, yeah, there's an exciting future ahead for radiomics-based uh, AI software in the clinical environment, but uh, any implementations need to be rigorously examined. Um, there's a vast amount of work to be done to ensure reliability and reproducibility. Um, and yeah, there's confidence that this project has the potential to contribute, contribute a lot to uh, the conversation around the use of heterogeneity in radiomics. Uh, but as, yeah, as I said, we're only in the nascent phase. Uh, so I've actually assembled some data um, to uh, help um, in the process of this hackathon um, in terms of uh, the MCT um, side of things. So I've, I've created a Google Drive link that I can, I can share with, uh, with everyone here. Uh, it contains a simulation, a relatively simple low activity simulation of um, 
uh, NEMA Phantom with uh, F18. Uh, that I've included all of the uh, macros and uh, the uh, root output file as well. Uh, and then alongside that, um, Jose, uh, who I believe is in the uh, in the chat, has uh, very kindly shared um, some actual um, MCT data that he took um, last week or a couple of weeks ago um, that I haven't had a chance to to look through properly yet. But I believe it's all it's all uploaded. So I'll share that link around um, after after the uh, the talk so yeah thank you for listening and that's um yeah everyone i want to say thank you um and yeah happy to happy to answer any questions thanks Jeff. <laughs> questions from the audience hi this is daniel uh, so if i understand correctly what is stopping you uh from using steer for the reconstruction is the fact that Steer doesn't allow for the virtual uh, crystals. Is that right? That's that's essentially yeah. That's that's the issue we've been having. So I've been I've been sort of uh, paying a lot of attention to the the MCT editions uh, pull request. Um, I've taken some of the stuff uh, from there, and um, there's some some good progress. So it's you know it helps to generate the the proper. Uh, header files and everything needed, but the minute I, I need to sort of you know, use um, LM to proj data, for instance, it, it really starts to struggle with um, with relabeling the the, um, the the root file data. And yeah, it's um, something I've been toying with a lot in the uh, in the background, a lot of stuff I've been doing. But um, really, yeah, I, th I think it's the kind of thing that needs more uh, stir savvy uh, eyes to, to look at, I think. Mm. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I think there's two, two levels there. One is um, being able to reconstruct data from gate, which I definitely think we can uh, enable this week. I don't see a problem with that. Um, the other one is enable reconstruction of data from the scanner, which is slightly more challenging. Uh, mm. And we, uh, a lot of it should be very similar to the MMR, but uh, there's bound to be differences. And um, we can, and, and those differences are not necessarily going to be hard to spot and and detect and fix so that I'm not sure if we can do that. And that will definitely mean digging into some more uh, murky depth. Um, so I don't know if we can achieve that one this week, but in any case, gate data, I'm very optimistic. Hopefully, yeah. Okay. Are there any further questions for George? In that case, no. So I think um, I think this was uh, informative, although even unfortunately somewhat long meeting. Um, but I, I think it, uh, I hope anyway that it was useful for everybody online. Um, as I said at the beginning, the uh, this was a start for our hackathon, but with uh, talks of interest for another audience. So I'd like to uh, close the, the uh, sort of general meeting at the moment by thanking all the speakers again, and also thanking you all for joining. Uh, the intention is that I suggest we would have a, a short break now maybe 10 minutes or so uh come back at f five past and uh just discuss a few pr practicalities for the hackathon not sure how much we can do uh today before lunchtime and unfortunately in the afternoon I, i'm uh, fully booked up but um let's try and see in in about i don't know half an hour or a bit 
longer what how we're going to run the hackathon and then i'm sure we have uh, more to say tomorrow morning okay so uh, thank you all again for joining and those people who were enthused by this all and want to join us for the hackathon do come back in about uh, nine minutes now just uh, in the same zoom meeting but i think we can stop the recording now thanks again Hi, Chris.